Good afternoon and welcome to the high-tech closing session. I am Pedro Filarino, the G of IC Tech, the organization that promotes the high-tech program uh, that we are presenting today. So ITEC is IC Tech is a not-for-profit association whose mission is to foster the creation of social and economic value from research and development activities by bridging the back gap between science and the market. I see tech is grounded upon a collaborative network that leverages a platform to link researchers and the business world. And currently, IC Tech has uh, 24 member companies from different sectors and different sizes, as you can see in this uh, slide. Uh, why we believe that what we do is uh, relevant for society. As you can see in this chart, over the last two decades, the investment in science and technology in Portugal has doubled, leading to an increase in the number of researchers and also in the production of knowledge that here is measured by number of uh, papers uh, published in uh, relevant uh, journals. Uh, this investment, uh, as you can see from this chart, has uh, led or has been leading to an increase in the indicators that represent knowledge production. And as you can see, Portugal uh, is not uh, very far behind, and in one indicator, in fact, is over its um, EU counterparts. Uh, in this chart, the next chart, 100 uh, is the average for all of the current uh, EU members plus the UK. However, uh, uh, we don't see the same uh, behavior in the indicators that relate to the mobilization of this knowledge by uh, society and namely by companies. And as you can see in this chart, although we are uh, above the average in the indicator related to in employment in fast growing companies of innovative sectors in all other uh, relevant uh, indicators that show the application of knowledge, we are uh, far behind and in some of them we are even below the 50% uh, average of the European Union. Uh, to increase the deployment of this, this knowledge that generate, generated with hindrance such a development organizations, the cooperation between these organizations and businesses is key to create value from this knowledge. However, this cooperation needs to overcome uh, several aspects, namely cultural and institutional differences, uh, different regulatory frameworks, and also geographic distance, to name just a few. To overcome these challenge, challenges, it is necessary to build bridges between these different institutional logics that they have a set of conflicting rules and norms that makes this cooperation more difficult. 
For that, it is important the role of what is called innovation intermediaries, because they are key to break these barriers and build these bridges between research and development organization and uh, the market. That's how ICTEC is positioned as an innovation intermediation organization that um, tries to connect the hover of knowledge to the demand of knowledge. We do it uh, by a set of initiatives that are designed to include both executive coaching, training, mentoring, and more important, networking. These initiatives uh, for on, on the market side for, for member companies of IC Tech includes the high solve problem program, uh, which is basically a program where we look to try to solve challenges that are posed by our member companies. And this program is exclusive only for IC Tech member companies. Then we have an uh, executive uh, coaching and training uh, innovation lab in which we help uh, companies uh, explore new business opportunities. It's a short program, uh, but extremely effective in trying to uncover new business opportunities. The next edition will happen in September, October, and applications are open currently. The other uh, training and ex executive coaching program called I've Helped You, and which we have been doing since IC Tech, or almost since IC Tech started in 2017, is a program that's focused on new product services and processes development. It is a longer program for our company teams, teams between three and five people from different uh, areas, uh, functional areas of the company. And uh, the goal is to help these teams develop a business case for a new product service or a process. And the next one will happen uh, also in September, October, and applications are currently open. For IC Tech, uh, for researchers, IC Tech has a bundle of three programs, which starts with this iTech program, whose close with, for, for which closing session we are here today for, for the two, 2021 edition. Um, and uh, ITEC, as you are going to see, is a uh, knowledge commercialization hands on experience. So today marks the end of the 2021 edition. And uh, we have already opened three registrations for next year, uh, which will uh, happen as usual between April and July. Uh, some of the teams that participate in uh, ITEC will be eligible to uh, participate in iHenshin, which is a uh, two months long, no, three months long uh, program, uh, where we help them prepare uh, for uh, looking for investment, uh, be it dilutive or non dilutive, namely through the recently created Horizon Europe uh, programs. Finally, we have uh, in this stream of programs, we have another one which is called High Tech Startup, which basically supports the development of the proof of concept and business development for. Uh, uh, relatively small number of teams that uh, manage to go through all of the programs. And ITEC startup runs what we hear, so it has no fixed beginning or ending. 
and its uh, adjustment wing phase. What brings us here today is the high tech uh, program, which I will uh, describe uh, now. So, uh, high tech is for research teams from Portuguese research and development organizations that are looking to advance closer to the market the technologies that are developed in their research activities. Uh, these research and developed organizations, as you are going to see today, may include uh, 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 IC tech member companies that uh, either produce internal research development or are collaborating with uh, uh, other institutions doing research and development, and you are going to see one case here today. The goal of Poetech, of high tech is to provide skills in knowledge commercialization to enable researchers first to link science and technology to product and market needs, uh, to better communicate science to a business audience, to evaluate different parts for moving technology to the market, and finally, to help researchers be better aligned with the Horizon Europe goals. The outcome of high tech is a business case for a product concept that is fostered by the technology that research team proposed to the high tech uh, program. Um, the program runs for 14 weeks. I each week, the team have deliverables, deliverables that they have to fulfill. And basically, these deliverables are the backbone of the program because they will they help the research teams build the business case in a piecewise uh, fashion. The program uh, also includes 12 hours of online training uh, focused on the early stages of business development and 18 hours of mentoring and tutoring to support the project development and the validation of the product concept that is generated throughout the program. Uh, the uh, program includes also three presentation sessions. The first one, it's very early in the program, is the technology pitch that basically we use to create a networking moment with, with the other participating teams. The second one is the pitch of the value proposition, which is a, a close, is a closed session just for IC tech member companies and the business case pitch is the one that we will present in this closing session. Um, I, ITEC is a, a, a free and no cost program. It's fully supportive by the members of IC Tech as part of the social of their social responsibility uh, projects. And uh, it's a hands on experience that uses uh, real projects. Uh, and allows for uh, the teams to network with IC tech, IC tech companies, entrepreneurs and investors in order to validate what they are presenting in the business case. So each team uh, was assigned two mentors and one advisor. Uh, so in 2021, we have overall 20 men mentors, four advisors and four, 44 researchers applied to the program. We are presenting here eight finalist teams that are represented by a group of 34 researchers. Uh, we need to 
knowledge, uh, the support in the high area of one of IC tech member companies, which is Clark Monet, that helps the team, the teams uh, throughout the program. And these are uh, 10 of the 20 mentors that uh, include previous alumni of the program or uh, people that are within the network or previous members of the program or people that are in our uh, network. So overall, these were the 20 mentors uh, that uh, uh, help us on a pro bono basis and which we would like to thank because they are the soul of the program and a very important part of the program. Uh, the advisors uh, for, for, for the teams were the usual uh, high tech uh, members for, uh, for high tech, IC tech members for high tech. Um, and we also had the help of uh, our teammates that are with us since the beginning that helped help us in preparing for both Mr the teams for both the midterm session and the final session. Angus King from Brown University, Roger Hibble that was previously at Rutgers University and also North Carolina State University and Steve Markham who is currently at North Carolina State University and to whom we thank a lot because they are a very important part of the program and as I said before when since we started the program some years ago. So these are the teams uh, that we, you will see this afternoon. The first one that's going to present is going to be Bactometer Diagnostics. They come from Inesk ID and in SMN, uh, both in Lisbon. The second one is Cryotest, and they come from the School of Science and Technology. Uh, the third one is Hardware, and they come from the Catholic Faculty of Biotechnology uh, in Porto. The fourth one is iGrape, which is uh, led by our member company, Sograp, and also includes a team from Ineshkem Hell in Lisbon, Iron Hell in Braga, and Universitat Bengli Studio in Milan, in, of course, Italy. Uh, Moon Therapeutics is the next one. Uh, they come from the School of Medicine of the University Minu. NOV uh, is a partnership between a startup called NOV and University of Aveiro, of course in Aveiro. Uh, Nevada is a team that comes from the School of Engineering of the University of Porto. And finally, the HATE is Purify that comes from CISECO at the e University of Hanfai. CISECO is the Materials Research Institute at the University of Hanfai. So, uh, the closing sessions uh, will include seven minute presentations and uh, five minutes of Q&A. Um, if uh, anyone in the audience will want to ask uh, questions, uh, you can use both the Q&A or the raise hand button that is either on the top of the screen or on the bottom of the screen in, in Zoom. Uh, if you raise your hand, you will be brought live to the session and you will ask the question in person. If uh, you want to write a question, uh, you can use the Q&A and uh, uh, one of us will uh, ask the question for you. Uh, because of the five minutes time limit, the Q&A uh, questions that uh, are uh, left 
uh, and response in the Q&A. We will uh, ask the teams to provide a sweet answer and we will send it to you by uh, email. Uh, one of the things that we have, the presentation is for its business presentation. So we ask you, because we have a very strict time limit, not to ask uh, scientific questions because usually they take a long time to reply and that's not the purpose of this session. So uh, when I finish, uh, I will hand over to Olivier Thor, who is going to host the first part of the session and he is going to introduce the teams. Then we will have a break um, and in the second part, uh, Christina Simoic, both, both all of you and Christina are advisors and team members of the high tech program. Um, she is going, Christina is going to host the second part of the session. Finally, the, the president of uh, the board of IC Tech, Antonio Pranton Vasconcelos, is going to close uh, the session. Okay, now before we start, we have a short video that uh, we made to introduce the, the teams and hopefully I have to stop sharing and reshare again because the video has helped. To have ideas, it's quite wonderful, but to have ideas that go somewhere, it's more difficult. This world is completely full of good ideas, but these ideas will only have a huge impact in the world. Not if well aligned with my passions or beliefs, but if we we'll align with the real uh, world needs. I usually do research because I love it. Looking into what I do in terms of how can I make a business proposition out of it? What is the perspective of the market? What do investors need in order to pursue this work? So it's something that I never thought about. With iTech, we could uh, understand better the needs of the market. And at this point, we could improve our product. And was very important because we could perform some modifications in our device in Nevada that we could better answer the needs of the customers. By looking at the markets, talking to the, the players, to the users, to the final users, to the people who, take, who make the decisions, we found out what would be the minimum uh, qualities that we, we had to produce so that we could sell the products. And I have to say that they weren't exactly what we were expecting. With the iTech program, we uh, realized that what was first a feeling that this would be a great success and this would change the paradigm of what we currently do in the wine sector. And now we really feel more confident to take this technology into the market. What high tech has allowed us was to do something that we have some constraints sometimes doing it in our environment. That is to contact possible clients, to search markets, to make the financials, to do all the work that otherwise wouldn't do and therefore uh, discover that we have something that is much more than research and we have a product that can reach the market, can have success on this market. We learn a lot during the whole process. We discover new things. Right now we are working much more as a group that wants to put the idea in the market. We work a lot. I think now we are um, ready to start a business. All researchers should apply for iTech because all that you need to transform the road between the science and technology to the market, all the, the classes and all the, the program, it's shaped and it's totally well aligned for the people to be able to enter in the market sector. 
I'm doing my PhD right now. I'm not sure if I'm going to stay in academia or in an industry. So I think it, uh, high tech gives you picture of both academia and industry and it's a bridge. So if I want to stay in academia, I can and through high tech, I totally understood what's out there if I enter the market as a researcher. Our participation in high tech has allowed us to uh, make the necessary contact to bring these products to the market. So after the high tech program, we will continue to make partnerships with the, these companies to bring our product to the market. I just look at my work with my heart and now I learned that I have to look in another way to it in order to propose value to the market and to people. We didn't know nothing, nothing, really nothing about how the market works and I think I tech teach us how can we sell our product and how can we find the people that really want to buy what we have. The ultimate objective of all research is to, to be used, so I think the iTech program is an excellent tool to do it. Okay, so now I am over uh, to Alipio Torre, who is going to host the first part of the session. And uh, I wish that you have an uh, enjoying after. So, Alipio, it's up to you. Okay, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you, Pedro, for your introduction. Um, so I'm Olivia. I'm one of the advisors for uh, high tech this year, and I have the honor of introducing four of the teams that this year have applied and successfully concluded the high seed tech. The first team that, that I'm going to call is called Bactometer, and as the name uh, implies, or at least discloses a little bit, it is a platform technology for the screening and detection of bacteria. So this team comes from Ines Kide and Ines Emian and is composed by a three-person team. It uh, comprises of Anna Rita Suarez, Dio Caetan, and Ruben Afonso. So the, the presenter for this team is going to be Dio, and I wish him the best of luck. And you, if you want, you can start sharing your screen and begin the presentation whenever you want. Best of luck. Thank you, Olivia. I hope you can hear me. Just enter presentation mode. So, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Dio Caetano from Back to Meter, and I'm here to present to you our first product. Our society, you and I included, is collectively traveling back to an era before antibiotics, when healthy people just died of minor injuries and infections. If nothing changes, by 2050, the number of deaths caused by drug-resistant bacteria yearly will rise to 10 million. Antibiotic resistance has been called a silent pandemic, but actually it has been screaming at us and we're just not listening. However, resistant bacteria threaten the life, uh, our way of life, and life as we know it. And we are already seeing its effects as even in its early stage, it kills as much as COVID. As a pandemic, multi-resistant bacteria is a social, economical, technical, and even a mentality problem. So there isn't exactly a simple solution. However, we learned from COVID that focusing on prevention and testing is actually the best course of action. And one of the most relevant places to implement that is in the hospitalar environment. Because nowadays, one out of every 10 patients in an hospital gets an infection. And one out of four of these infections are caused by multi-resistant bacteria. This is extremely concerning when one considers that some of these trends have mortality rates of up to 40%. Multi-resistant bacteria are introduced in the hospital environment by patients that are colonized with these pathogens. Colonized patients are asymptomatic and admitted into the hospital for different reasons and unknowingly carry this dangerous bacteria. Screening everyone for uh, looking for these colonized patients is as of yet impractical, 
and does not fit the existing processes inside the hospital. But the problem remains. Just one single patient colonizing bacteria can cause an hospital-wide outbreak. The problem should be attacked where it uh, hurts the most. And in this case, it's the emergency care and consequence intensive care unit admission. Nowadays, most facilities do not perform any screening, although they know there are risk factors. And colonized patients are unknowingly placed in the same ward as everyone else. On more sophisticated facilities, there is some kind of screening, but the performed analysis takes too long, and only after that, the patient is moved into isolation. Either way, there is an intersection between non-colonized and colonized patients. Existing methods for testing are just too slow or expensive. And a decision regarding destination of a critical patient should be taken uh, before six to eight hours have passed. And at that time, there isn't enough information for an informed decision. So the only choices are isolation of every high-risk patient, which is costly, or a prescription of antibiotics to everyone, which contributes to, uh, for, further contributes to the problem. So it's cheap in the short run, but it has had a very high cost to society in general. So you can see there is actually an urgent necessity for a screening technology that can produce a result in less than an hour to allow the physician to make informed decisions, save lives, and use antibiotics only when strictly necessary. Bactometer is our first product. It's based on a platform technology, our point of care magnetic flow cytometer, which is capable of detecting a broad range of micrometric pathogens. In this case, we tailored it specifically for rapid screening of bacteria. In this product, we focus the capabilities of magnetic immunolabeling, integrated sensors, and neural network-based signal processing, and produce an extremely accurate and inexpensive point-of-care device for multi-resistant bacteria screening. How does it work? Well, a sample is introduced in a microfluidic system that contains magnetic particles and antibodies tailored to the specific bacteria. Labeling and purification steps are performed, followed by a magnetic concentration step, which allows for an increment in detection in our specific magnetic sensors. The concentration step that we perform and the fact that biological samples have no magnetic background are, what are the main advantages that make it possible for the system to use complex matrices like swab, urine, or blood. All these features are concentrated in an inexpensive compact device with no moving parts, making it uh, accessible to every part of the world. This allows the decentralization of microbiology analysis, widespread optimization of antibiotic use, and appropriate application of contagion preventing measures inside the time frame that it's actually needed. This is before 60 minutes have passed. There is a growing competition in this market with many bulky and expensive new devices and some slow and cheap classical methods. Bactometer, however, produces quick and accurate results at a fraction of the cost and size of the competition, allowing us to penetrate more markets and reach very high testing numbers. This is why the integration of our technology in healthcare facilities will provide faster decision pathways and automated procedures that will positively disrupt the patient care and reintroduce into the hospital safety from resistant pathogens to both the vulnerable patients and also healthcare workers. Our technology will allow health facilities to finally implement CDC and World Health Organization guidelines that are mostly infeasible at the moment for both economical and logistic reasons. By tackling these big problems, a global pandemic, we access a global market that has been steadily growing. At first, we'll focus on detecting the three multi-resistant bacteria that as a set are responsible for 40% of the infections and consequently for a similar percentage of the economic burden. Our main activity as a startup will be research and development and product quality assessment. And at full production speed, it is expected that we uh, subcontract the production of both the test and the machine. To reach the final clients, we plan on using well-established distributors. Now, considering our current development stage and IP protection status, we estimate that with the correct investment strategy, we can reach the min minimum viable product after just one year and first better product sales in two to three years. Our full market entry is planned at five years with a total investment 
of 10 million euros. In the first five years, we will focus on European and North American markets, and we project to reach, to, in, by 2030, a revenue of 130 million euros. With this revenue, the break-even point is projected to be in 2027. We are a young, dynamic and multidisciplinary team that already boasts a combined experience in biosensing technology research and development of around 20 years. So we are in fact the correct team to go the distance with this particular product, Baxometer, but also with other biosensing products we have in our pipeline. Multi-resistant bacteria is the next pandemic and Baxometer is our solution. Thank you. Okay, so great job, Yo. Uh, now is the time for the Q&A. We have five minutes and I've been asked to be a little bit strict. I'll try not to be too much. So let's see what uh, uh, questions come up. So, so one question from uh, Raul Saraiva, can you multiplex? How many bacterial species, strains can you test for in a single run? Uh, yeah, we can multiplex. So that's, that's a question of complexity in the microfluidic um, cartridge. So we probably will start with independent cartridges, one for each bacteria, disposable cartridges. And depending on the needs uh, for each hospital, which uh, depending on the history, have different uh, bacterial menus that they want to search, we'll probably start creating multiplexed versions which tailor uh, enterobacters or other different uh, bac bacteria that are found in the same type of samples so that this, the, the search can be more broad and effective. Okay. So one, another question. Uh, so Luis Pedro Correa says, congratulations for the project. How many tests can a single device process simultaneously? I think you addressed that. Yes. Yeah, how many tests can the device? Many. How many tests can you? At the same time? Yes. So we are developing our device so that it can be uh, scalable in a way that we can put together uh, as many devices as we want. And for the client, it will look just like a single device. So depending on the needs for the hospital and on the, need, the throughput needs, we can either increase it or decrease it, also depending on the size of the laboratory. So we are targeting a very small device, more or less around this size. So it can be used everywhere, but then it can be uh, put together like a Lego to produce a more uh, a, a device with higher throughput. Okay, so if you could say like a number of tests per hour? More like... um, yeah, so one test at this moment, it takes around 60 minutes. But as we want to multiplex, and that's uh, as I was saying, we'll probably end up with for larger labs with larger, larger equipment that can multiplex like 10, uh, I don't know, 20, 100 tests in that same amount of time. And what are your expectations regarding the number of devices needed per hospital? Um, I, I, th I think, depending on the size, so for, for an hospital, uh, for, for a Portuguese size hospital, we think like five or ten devices or as i said one that has those ten devices in the same bunch so depending if uh, you want to decentralize and use it closer to the patient so if it's a necessity that the hospital identifies that you need to have the devices closed in every ward then you can have multiple devices and if or if the the hospital has a centralized lab where they want to take all the tests then we can put all the same devices in the same cluster but i would say five to ten okay and it would be uh, reasonably easy to implement and operate by the, um, the hospitals, correct? Yeah, so we are now working on the parts where you can just put the sample inside in a, as you do in, in other equipment and just press a button and it gives you the results. So there's minimal, we expect to be minimal preparation of the samples. Okay, so you have um, a congratulations of a great pitch. 
uh, asking also what who are the customers by Veronica Martins. Okay, thank you, Veronica. Um, so the final customers will be hospitals, laboratories, and maybe in in a, in a, in a further future, uh, first um, first health. Uh, so like wh where people go and, and do checkups. But our client will actually be the distributors. So we'll deal mostly with distributors, and we'll uh, rely on their capacity to make to to distribute the, the device. Worldwide, of course, there is a need for some marketing and some relationship, at least in the, in the, in the first years of every new client, but we expect to, to work mostly in research and development and leave that part for the distributor. Okay, thank you. So you have one last question so from Patricia Rodrigues. And the question is, does your technology only work for multi-resistant bacteria detection? Thank you for that question. So, as a, as as we say in the presentation, this is a technology a technological platform. So it's basically a, a magnetic flow cytometer, which means that it can count cells or uh, analytes of um, from I don't know, one micrometer to 100 micrometers, depending on the size of the channel. So it can be applied to many different many different applications, uh, like just simple blood analysis, search for tumor cells. And the one that we think is the one with the largest market and the closest to application now is uh, multi-resistant bacteria detection. But yes, it's, um, it can have many applications. Okay, thank you. I think we've reached both the time limit and the limit of questions for now. So <laughs> thank you, Diogo. Thank you, thank to you, the thank you for the nice questions. And Ruben. So I'll please ask you now to remove your presentation and we'll prepare for the next team. Okay. okay. And as our next team, we have Cryodes. So this name is a little bit more um, tricky to find out what they do, but let me tell you a little bit. So Cryodes comes from the Nova School of Science and Technology. They have a biocompatible cryoprotectant agent. I'll let them explain what that is. That allows for the cryopreservation of cells for cell therapy. So this team is composed of four elements from Alexandre Paiva, Ana Rita Duarte, Ana Rita Gameiro, and Marta March. And they will uh, be presenting this project. And to do that, they have Ana Rita to lead the charge. And so if Ana Rita is ready, I'll ask you to please start sharing your, your presentation and start whenever you want. Best of luck. OK, thank you. And, okay. Let me just. I don't know what's happening. Okay. Is this okay? No. Sorry, I don't know what's happening. Okay, I think you jumped a few slides. Okay. Let's you see. have time. You don't need to rush so much. <laughs> it's okay. Good luck. Okay. Thank you. So hi. I'm Anrita and I'll, oops, I don't know what's happening. Let me, sorry. Let me just see if I can fix this and I think it's okay. So, hi, I'm Rita and I'm part of the CryoDash team and I'll be presenting our amazing technology for the cryopreservation of stem cells. So why stem cells? Well, stem cell therapy is a relatively new treatment that can spare millions of lives and it has been considered the future of medicine. And this is proven by the exponential increase in clinical trials. In just the last two years, these numbers have doubled, but there is much more to come as is expected to continue to grow. But there is one problem regarding these therapies, is the fact that cells must be frozen so they can be used whenever, they, whenever needed. When you freeze cells, which, as you know, may, are mainly composed by water, there is ice crystal formation that ruptures the cell membrane, causing cells to die. And because of that, a very complex process is used. So after collecting the cells, we need to add a cryoprotected agent, or a CPA, to avoid the formation of those crystals. But the standard CPA, which is a synthetic compound called DMSO, is toxic for the cells. Unless it's frozen at very low temperatures, 
normally using a cryo tank filled with liquid nitrogen. Then the samples are transported, which requires the use of dry ice, which contributes also to an increase on the cost and also on the carbon footprint. But also because it's toxic, the CPA must be removed before injecting, injecting in, the patient, in the patient. So how can our team help companies to overcome these problems? With our technology. So we were inspired by animals that withstand huge thermal amplitudes between winter and summer. But how can, can these animals survive during winter? Well, they literally freeze. But when temperature rises, they, they defrost and they just can keep living as nothing has happened. But what's their secret? Well, in fact, these animals build up certain compounds in their cells that when combined together, they avoid ice crystallization and that allows their survival. With our disrupt, um, sorry. So our nature inspired technology called natural diplomatic systems resulted from our research on how to bring these tools to the lab. The systems are nothing else but mixture of those compounds, which are typically solid, but when combined together, they become liquid at room temperature. And yes, it's that simple. We basically take two solids, we mix them together, we wait for the magic to happen, and at the end, we get one liquid. And that liquid has amazing properties, completely different from the ones that we started with. And one of these properties is to avoid the formation of ice during freezing. And so, when applied as cryoprotected agent, is much, is much better than DMSO. So we took this technology and we created Cryodash, a patent portfolio of cryoprotected agents, which constituent components are classified as generally recognized safe products. Regarding our competition, our direct competitors are the companies that sell our CPAs, namely Pharmacosmos, which sells Pentahive, and Sigma that distributes the MSO and CryoSO3. Although Pentahive is also rely on natural products as CPAs with low toxicity, it still requires the, the use of a very, very small amount, like one to 2% of the MSO for an efficient cryopreservation. Also, none of them is able to ensure cell viability at milder temperatures as cryodash. And as important, our product which must easier to apply than our competitors. So in fact, uh, what Cryodash is doing to the cryopreservation process is making it much, much simpler and completely addressing the needs of this industry. So our plan is to remove the toxic CPA from the process and replace it by Cryodash. Moreover, because of the complexity of the cryopreservation process using the MSO, up to 15% of the cells um, do not survive freezing. But with Cryodash, cells can be stored in a simpler process using a freezer like the one we have at home, increasing viability while at the same time, it saves up to 90% of the operating costs. And the transportation, the transportation is no longer an issue because you just need a cooler box, reducing transportation cost, carbon footprint, and allowing some clients to reach new markets. But there is also growing evidence that CPAs such as the MSO affect uh, cellular structure, making it mandatory for its removal, removal before injection. But because cryodes is non-toxic, there is no need to remove it before the injection in the patient. So our plan is to enter the stem cell therapy market in the next three to four years by 2025. This interesting market has a growth rate of 26% and is estimated to reach 25 billion euros by that time. Uh, knowing that more than 90% of the clinical trials in cell therapy are between pre-registration and phase two, we do believe that this is exactly our target, which means that we are at the right time, at the right place to launch Cryodash. The development of products will be performed by our team while the production will be outsourced to a certified manufacturer. All the logistics will also be performed by us and we will follow a B2B business model where Cryodash will be sold directly to companies working in the early stages of cell therapy. So
So for the next year and a half, we expect to finish the development of our product so that it's market ready by 2024. And then we expect to enter the, the, the therapy market in the following year. We also expect to reach the break even point one year, one year after entering the market and have a net profit of 98 million within 10 years. And after this time, we expect to continue as exponential growth on our revenues. And this is the team behind Cryodash. We are composed by a multidisciplinary group of researchers from Novum with a strong, a strong experience in R&D, but also with experience in transferring technology to industry. We also have a commercial experience in working for larger companies and bring products to the market. And together we have been working in this technology for the past decade. To wrap up, cryodes is a cryoprotected agent that allows the cryopreservation of cells at milder temperatures, avoiding toxic CPAs. And thank you. Great job, Rita. So now it's time for the question. And you have to make, want to make any statements with those? Or just for people to see? Yeah. <laughs> okay. There, there, yeah, just leave it there. <laughs> okay. So, uh, regarding uh, your presentation, it's time for the, the questions. As we mentioned before, five minutes. And we already have one question for you. That was fast. So, <laughs> Patricia Rodriguez asks you, is this a platform technology? Are there, your, uh, there, are there any other applications that could be foreseen or envisaged? So I will let Marta answer to that question. I think she's- Thank you, Rita. Here. So yes, yes, in fact, this technology has the potential to be used in other applications. For example, in the veterinary uh, cell therapies, which do not use the cryopreservation of cells at the moment. And because of that, they only have a 48 hour window between the collection of the cells and the, their injection in the, um, the patients. And after this time, the cells start to lose uh, their viability. So with our product, these companies would have the, the chance to cryopreserve cells, expand their businesses and uh, deliver their, their therapies uh, to new markets. Eventually, our technology could also be used uh, in the cryopreservation of cells for uh, IV, IVF, or um, even for the stabilization of vaccines. Okay, thank you, Marta. Um, a follow up question uh, comes more or less in the same line. So, are these compounds applicable to other markets rather than the life sciences? Oh, this is a challenge. <laughs> and if so, which markets? And why have you decided to go for the more regulated market? I think I can answer that. Um, yes, they can be used to other markets, uh, such as food preservation, for example. Um, and, and uh, of course, this was a, a much more interesting market. Well, we first, because of the dimension of the market, of course, and because it's a growing market. Um, what attracted mostly on the, on the stem cell market is that for example, the IVF is much more, uh, the IVF, the vaccine sensibilization are much more regulated. The food uh, stabilization, we need to also validate uh, the, the product, but this is starting now. So we can work with our clients in the validation of the product that is starting right now. And because they are growing in, in uh, clinical trials, and we can see that the clinical trials are exponentially growing now, it's, it's the much more interesting market for us to start with them now. It's not such an established market like the other ones. Okay, thank you, Olshan. Um, next question from Andres Suarez. Uh, good solution for a big problem. How about, uh, how about, huh? How long term? How about long term storage? So I think the, the question is for you to elaborate on the uh, on the practicalities of long term storage and how does your products behave in that? Well, in terms of long term storage, that requires time. Um, so we only have um, some evidence in terms of uh, short term uh, short term storage. So at this point, the cells are frozen, so that now we have to wait for the right time to take them off and do all the studies necessary to, to, to see what happens in the long-term storage. Well, that's exactly one other reason why we chose stem cell therapies, because these therapies, the, the time before the collecting of the cells and the application of the cells is much shorter than, for example, for IVF and so forth. So that's also one reason why we chose this market. Okay. 
Thank you, Alexandre. Thank you, Rita. I think we have time for one more question. And I think... Uh, okay, we have a question from Diogo that says, what is your vision to prove to your, to your clients that your product is safe, assuming there is uh, still no clinical trial? Are there any proxies? Thank you. Rita, do you want to answer that? Yes, perhaps I can answer that. Uh, well, what we intend to do is actually uh, in the beginning um, show the evidences that we have in the in the lab using different type of uh, of cells, uh, proving that the product works. Um, we intend to work uh, or to sell these uh, compounds to uh, cell therapy companies. In fact, they are the ones that are going to run uh, cl clinical trials, and we hope that they incorporate our product in their um, in their product uh, when doing the the clinical trials. But basically, what we have is. Um, is uh, labor laboratory evidences that our product is safe and uh, uh, it performs even better than the standard CPA that is the dimethyl sulfoxide. Okay, thank you, Rita. Um, I think you are now through the, um, the questions, but mainly you are through with time. So thank you very much for your presentation and thank you very much for your uh, candid answers. It's now time for you to please um, remove the presentation and we will now start with the next team okay thank you great job Okay, I think I'm now back. I don't know if you lost me or not, but I lost you. So next is hardware. And hardware uh, comes from the Universidade Católica Portuguesa from Porto, from the Faculty of Biotechnology. And they are composed for, uh, of a four-person uh, team. So composed of Daniela Paiva, Joana Sá, Pedro Ribeiro, and Pedro uh, Rodrigues. And they have... Uh, decision support tool for the early detection of heart pathologies. So they do this through a single electrocardiogram. So to tell us a little bit more about that, we, we have Pedro Ribeiro to present the team and their project. Pedro, if you want, you can start sharing uh, your presentation and please start when everyone. Best of luck for your presentation. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for coming today and give us the opportunity to show you our company, Artware, and the motivation for creating our service. Artware is a decision support tool for detecting cardiovascular pathologies. Cardiovascular pathologies are diseases that affect the heart and the entire cardiac system. Actually, they are different types of cardiovascular diseases, as you can see by looking at this table. And the, main, and the main problem lies in the fact that approximately one third of the deaths worldwide are due to the cardiovascular diseases. These pathologies are increasing in incidence because they are associated with several risk factors, increasingly common worldwide, like smoking, diabetes, and obesity. In fact, in 1990, there were 271 million people with cardiovascular diseases. And in 2019, that number has doubled. With the high rates of people with cardiovascular diseases, we know that the US has a cost in cardiovascular patients of around $219 billion and the European Union of 210 billion euros. And according to the World Health Organization, the treatment of cardiovascular diseases should start as soon as possible. And in order to do that, reduce the number of deaths and improve the quality of life for the patients, what we need to do is to detect this condition sooner, allowing the physicians to treat earlier, stop the disease progression and save lives. That's the most important of all. I can give you a very simple example for this case. There are pathologies such as dilated cardiomyopathy, 
that currently are undetectable with, until uh, it's in a more advanced stage. So, stopping the progression of cardiovascular diseases and reducing the number of deaths that are the main priorities of the health systems. And what they need? Detection of cardiovascular diseases earlier and reliability on the diagnosis support, which leads to earlier treatment, a decrease in the number of deaths and people with severe cardiovascular diseases, and a decrease in the number of medical appointments which results in an increase in the patient's quality of life and a decrease in the financial cost in these diseases. The diagnosis of a cardiovascular disease happens when a patient has an appointment with his doctor. After the appointment, the exams are performed, including the ECG. The ECG is an exam that allows you to estimate the electrical activity of the heart, and the exam results in a graphic where their analysis allows the detection of cardiovascular diseases. We thought that the ECG had the data that was not visible. So we, we designed a technology that uses a simple ECG, the frontline exam. We created models for each pathology with a, a statistical analysis, and we created artificial intelligence, the artificial intelligence that was able to detect this, these cardiovascular diseases in the early stages. Our product is a decision support tool that detects cardiovascular diseases from an ECG, which is the exam that's illustrated in this graphic, using Taylor models for each disease. It is due to the Taylor models for each pathology that we obtain several benefits, such as detection of some pathologies in the early stages that are not uh, detected with the naked eye, enable earlier treatment, and higher accuracy when compared to our competition, which leads to increase in the reliability of support of, of diagnosis. And now will our business model work? First of all, it starts with the patient going to the hospital or to the clinic, and then getting a prescription to perform an exam. After performing the exam, the ECG signal uh, is forward to the hardware servers, where it will be automatically analyzed and a pre-report that needs the validation of a cardiologist will be created. Afterwards, this pre-report is given to our clients, either to the hospital or to the clinic. In addition, for hardware to reach hospitals and clinics, it is necessary to involve a marketing team allowing the introduction of our decision support tool. First of all, we must establish partnerships with the uh, healthcare professionals for the demonstration, validation, and implementation of our, our, of our service through multiple papers publisher. It is also necessary for the marketing team to promote the product through medical conferences. As for our sales, we will sell our service through direct sales and website sales. Regarding the existing market, both the US and the European Union. It is important to mention that around 600 million ECGs are carried out per year. If we charge five euros per ECG, our civil market will be three billion euros. Our main competitors are Veshalin, Schiller, and G Healthcare. However, our competitors have low accuracy rates and detect very few pathologies which is why they are not considered good diagnosis support softwares in the market. Artware not only has a higher accuracy, but will also be able to detect at least five more groups of pathologies and their corresponding variants. As for our financials, the first two years are dedicated to product development, marketing, intellectual property, and regulation. In the third year is the entry into the European market, and in 2025, it's the entry into the American market. We estimate the entire project will take 22 months to reach the market, and our milestones are the patent application and first stage of development, the second stage of development, the patent filing and, th and third stage of development, the prototype, and finally, the entry into the market. Our team is a multidisciplinary team, the team members have very different backgrounds, ranging from the engineering degrees to the health degrees. 
We have gathered approximately four years of experience in the, in the field of electrocardiography in a clinical context, and even more than eight years in the area of software development. To sum up, due to the tailored tailor models for each disease, increasing the reliability of diagnosis support, and also allowing the, the detection of pathologies earlier, hardware will save lives. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Pedro, for your presentation. Great job. So now is the time for the questions. Are you ready? Ask the rest of the team to please turn on your cameras so that you may show it. Okay. So uh, first question from John Flavin. Why is the price five euros per ECG? So uh, I can answer to this question. Uh, actually, during the, the project, we try to keep in contact with uh, possible customers and uh, possible users uh, of our product. And uh, we got uh, some answers. Um, and in a conversation with, with a health professional uh, from uh, London, uh, a big hospital in London, uh, he told me that a uh, good price um, is uh, five euros because of the price of per ACG uh, in um, in London. And uh, he also said me that uh, this price is because of uh, a big potential of this product. Product. Okay. Thank you. Um, market validation. That's the best. So now, Flip Portela asks you, um, what is the validation so far? So the number of ECGs evaluated that you have currently done? Until this moment, we validated um, uh, with a um, uh, database that we also use. We separated some groups that were not uh, treated that were not the the models for its pathology were not created through the those groups and we validated with artificial intelligence okay um so angus kingham nice clear presentation i assume that your potential impact may be limited if you wait until the person shows symptoms leading to a cardiology appointment if there is any potential or discussion of more routine testing, thus leading to diagnosis before the patient is aware of symptoms? Um, it's a good question. Um, when we are talking about uh, appointment, uh, doesn't need to, to be a cardiology appointment. Um, and uh, we are talking, um, we use the ACG because um, the ACG is performed uh, in uh, several times as a, a routine test uh, before some um, surgical interventions. So um, we don't need to wait for symptoms. Uh, we can detect pathologies um, before symptoms because uh, ACG is performed uh, like a routine test. The other question? I don't know if I answered. I think you actually answered the both. Okay. Um, so um, you have a, a follow-up question from Philippe Portel. So he wants to ask you if your solution works with uh, any ECG or does it need any special hardware or software for you to be able to read the information it provides, to read it? We only tested until now with the resting ECGs. And uh, we just need to receive the, the ECG signal and then uh, we start the, the treatment. Okay. But uh, we can also adapt uh, this algorithm yes. to stress tests and the alter that is the ECG during uh, 24 hours or uh, 72. We mm -hmm. can also adapt. Okay. And uh, I think following up on what you're saying, I think we have two questions that actually more or less match. One is from Andre Vieira, which asks you if this technology could be uh, coupled with the smartwatch ECG done in real time. 
And this actually links with, I think, Juan Piteira's question, which is, could these algorithms uh, be used with wearable devices using different sensors, for example, inertial sensors? So basically the question is, are wearables uh, a possibility to use your algorithms? Uh, yes, uh, because uh, we only need the ACG signal. So it's possible. Okay. So we have a great opportunity there. <laughs> Call Apple. Anyway, we are now uh, out of time. Uh, I'm sorry. And I think uh, I just have to thank you for the great presentation, a great set of answers. And please ask you to please take down your presentation and see you in a few minutes uh, on the break. <laughs> okay, thank you. Finally, the, the last team in the, more, uh, in the first set of uh, team presentations. The team is called iGrape and it is composed by, of six elements. We have Virgen Brejes, Hugo Oliveira, João Piteira, Natasha Fontes, Roberto Beguin, and Valentina Giovanzana. So they hail from uh, four institutions, the ENL in Braga, Ines Camien in Lisbon, uh, Universidad degli Studio di Milano in Italy, and Sograp, a uh, partner company. So iGrip is a um, monitoring device for, to uh, monitor the grape maturation using a cloud-based service. So to present us uh, this project, uh, I ask Hugo Oliveira to please start your camera, uh, share your presentation and start whenever you want. Best of luck. Thank you so much. I will just share my screen. Okay, it's sharing. Okay, just a second. Just to check the full presentation mode. I think we are there. We are ready. Start with everyone. Best of luck. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, good afternoon to everyone. Uh, it's a pleasure for me to introduce you iGrape, the company that will bring the lab to the vineyard. So as you probably have seen before, the evolution of grapes in a vineyard comprises different stages in a process that lasts for approximately four months. What you might not know is that in a time window of a few days, the quality of the grapes can be great or poor. Indeed, there is an optimum period of a couple of days to harvest the grapes with their highest quality, which is critical to produce the best wines. This quality significantly decreases around this optimal period. And this fact has a direct relationship, not only with the quality, but also with the profitability of both grapes and wine. For example, grapes for wine with commercial grade A plus are valued four times higher than grapes for wine with commercial grade C. So to find the optimum harvest timing, it is needed to monitor grape maturation. The gold standard to monitor grape maturation is performed on a wet lab that provides weekly reports of the maturation status, which limits the prediction of the optimal harvest day. The full analytical protocol comprises the collection of a random sample of berries in the vineyard, the sample preparation, and the multiple wet chemistry assays. The reliability of the process is also an issue because random sampling is highly dependent on the operator and additionally, in each season, wet cam assays destroy 2.5 kilograms of grapes per hectare. Therefore, to manage the high variability that can, can be found on the same vineyard, as you can see in this picture on the left side of your screen, as well the short optimal window that we have talked before, we decided to develop a solution that allows a real-time and standalone monitoring that is non-destructive and chemical-free that also reduces the need of manpower and provides information with temporal and spatial resolution. In this context, we are introducing iGrape, a proprietary technology based on a network of IoT sensors combined with advanced data analysis, overcoming the use of wet chemistry assets. This technology will provide real-time information about grape maturation, including levels of pH, total acidity, bricks, and potential alcohol 
but also the maturation profile, and last but not least, a prediction of the harvest date. The physics of eye grape sensor is based on the interaction of light with the grapes. These are tailor-made optical sensors that are installed inside the grape bunch. The first step of eye grape measurement cycle includes the generation of optical signals that are collected by a controller box. These signals are then sent to a cloud database where they are processed and converted in different parameters of interest and graphically presented to the end user. Our machine learning models have an excellent correlation with that CAM results and still have a potential to be improved by taking advantage of the growing size of our database. So iGrape is the unique tool that for the first time allows, provides real-time information directly from the grape bunch. In these graphs, it's possible to observe an example of a maturation profile for bricks obtained by both standard wet cam assays and iGrape technology in a commercial vineyard. This is, there is an excellent correlation between the results obtained by both methods. iGrape application concept is currently protected by a family of, of patents, granted or pending in all major geographies of wine production. Data analysis algorithms will be protected by trade secrets. Our business model will be based on a subscription service that targets two segments of wine producers, implying different sensor densities. Our premium service targets premium wine producers, where the precision and accuracy of grape maturation monitoring is a must have to produce premium wines. Our regular service targets regular wine producers who want to optimize the value of their harvests. iGrip technology targets wine producers worldwide. The current size of the market targets a total vineyard area of 3.55 million hectares. Regarding an average cost of 100 euros per actor to perform grape maturation monitoring based on wet cam, we estimate a market size of 355 million euros. Although the concept of high grape is unique, there are some competitors that are listed in this table. The first is the current state of the art based on destructive wet cam assets, which don't provide real time information about grape maturation. The second competitor represents a portable technology for in situ monitoring. This bachymeter device has been introduced to measure the phenolic maturation index. However, it still needs manual operation and it also targets different parameters than the ones covered by iGrape. iGrape will also have a significant impact on the profitability of wine producers. In this example, we are considered a vineyard of 100 hectares producing 10 tons of grapes per hectare which corresponds to approximately 1 million bottles of wine. Although iGrape is three times more expensive than the regular wet cam monitoring, iGrape is capable to add 10% to the wine value, creating a combined benefit of 380,000 euros. Our roadmap is to launch iGrape in the market in 2024. The first step consists in the refinement of the current statistical models that will follow up on our previous activities. The second step will make available the full application with our final hardware configuration. The third step aims the upscale of the technology to a TRL9, including trials with early stage adopters. Finally, phase four will be market related and comprises all the activities needed to launch the product. We estimate a total cost of 2.5 million euros to complete these four steps. According to our roadmap, we estimate to have our first sales in three years. Our strategy to reach is to reach the top four wine producing countries in the world plus Portugal in the first four years of sales. This implies the deployment and operation of more than 1 million sensors over a five year period in an area of vineyard that corresponds to approximately 5% of the total target area of 3.55 million hectares. The iGrape team includes researchers from different R&D institutions across Europe and also Sogra, the largest Portuguese wine company. In summary, iGrape is the first technology that allows the grape maturation control in real time with a disruptive impact in the prediction of the optimal harvest date and in global management of the vineyards. iGrip is also the unique tool that makes possible to extract the full value from the grapes. Thank you.
Okay, thank you, Hugo. Great presentation. Good job. Um, let's go now for the, um, the Q&A. So I ask the rest of the team members to please um, turn on your cameras and let's start. So you already have one question. It's by, uh, by Julie Espia. What is the impact of this technology in the regular operation of a wine company? Yeah, I think for that question, probably Natasha can comment. Yes, uh, thank you for the question. I think that um, beyond or besides what has been presented by Hugo, um, it is important to, um, to point out that the wine sector is facing many challenges, such as climate change. And indeed, the grape and wine production depends greatly on climate and thus several factors that cannot be controlled, but rather they can be just monitored. This uh, uh, makes the digital transformation a must have and a need and having access to digital tools like iGrape uh, supporting uh, the decision making in a real time basis will and obviously improve management efficiency and uh, this will help us to better adapt and to reduce and this is very important the risk of harvesting low quality grapes and ultimately to lose yield okay this is something that we need to stand out also such a tool can be part of a global strategy to target wine sector sustainability goals as it will allow the reduction of chemicals uh, with the wet cam analysis to reduce waste and also to reduce, and this is important to mention, CO2 em emissions with samples transportation from the field to the lab. Well, taken together, the benefits of such a solution will help us to uh, improve our resilience towards the many challenges we are facing. And I would like also to stand out that this solution is in line with the R&D strategy which has been identified by the Comité 1, which is an organization representing the wine business sector at European level. Thank you. Okay, so now we have, uh, I think, a live question. So there's a brave soul that <laughs> wants to ask a question live. Uh, Eduardo Rosa, am I correct? Hello, can, can you hear me? Yes, Eduardo, we yes. can hear you. Yes, okay, thank you very much. Uh, my question is, uh, knowing that the hyperspectral imaging is also um, uh, a tool to, to perform in the same way the, the maturation index um, or trying to be in the, in, the, in the near future, what is the advantage of this system? Second question is, you mentioned 10 tons per hectare. Is not too much regarding the average in Portugal? Okay, yeah. guys. Yeah, I can okay. address that question. Yeah, we'll go, or... yeah, yeah, sure, go. Well, uh, I think that um, the main point, and that's why I, I wanted to jump into this, uh, the answer of this question, is that hyperspectral imaging, although it is, and you're right, uh, competing with this solution, I don't believe it will compete in this target price. Okay, it's more expensive than the one we are developing, but then my colleagues can uh, uh, give more information. Um, the other question regarding the, the, the yield, uh, this is an average value for a global production, not targeting Portugal, okay? Okay. Thank you. Yeah, I don't know if uh, Roberto and Valentini want to comment something on this part of the upper spectral imaging and the spectral um, analysis of uh, grape maturation. Uh, yes, Hugo. Um, basically, I agree with Natasha and uh, what he, what it was stated. Yeah, hyper spectral. I think that uh, in our vision, so to use a uh, high number of sensors in, uh, in a wide area uh, for now is not, uh, is not comparable with the use of uh, hyperspectral because hyperspectral is uh, uh, need to, 
to more work, to, to go to a simplification of the device, of the technology. And uh, in uh, our, uh, our time, at this time, uh, I think that uh, a more simple way, an optical illumination with uh, a slight number of, uh, of uh, LEDs, uh, so a very simple uh, sensor, like uh, the IREP sensor is in, uh, at this time, uh, the good solution. Okay. okay. We are now almost out of time, so I'll ask a couple of very quick question, like yes or no, almost like. So one, um, could this monitor system be used to make corrections to the vineyard growing conditions, such as soil composition and watering? Yeah, I can try to quickly go on that. We are actually part of our research is uh, related with that. We are not present presenting this product here. Uh, we are focused on maturation. But yes, we are actually trying to deal uh, with, uh, with uh, this question in our research. Okay, three questions in one. So I'm from uh, Pedro Villarinho, from Angus King and Francisco. So you propose one sensor per bunch of grapes. What, uh, correct? What is the lifetime of the sensors? And does your cost include the labor cost of placing those sensors in the vineyard? I can answer that. Um, lifetime. Um, as far as uh, we understand now, it's five to ten years. So obviously this is an electronic product. It needs to uh, go through reliability tests and uh, certification tests. So this is one thing. Uh, the second question was about the number of sensors uh, per bunch. No, we don't have one sensor per bunch. We install typically an average of 10 sensors per hectare of vineyard. So that's basically the approach. And we pick one bunch as a, as a reference for these measurements. Uh, the last one... Labor cost. Does labor, labor cost, price? yes, is included. Okay. Thank you, João. Thank you, Hugo. Thank you, Natasha and Roberto and Valentina. Um, thank you all for your presentation. Now it's time for us to finish. Um, Liz, you can may take down your presentation and uh, we'll now uh, go for a break. So we have now a 10 minute break. Thank you very much for everyone that has been listening. And obviously thank you to the teams that did great work. And it was a great presentation and a great experience. Um, going through this experience with you in the last couple of weeks. Great job. See you in uh, 10 minutes for the next four teams. Hi, good afternoon and welcome back. My name is Christina Simones and after having the pleasure to advise some of the teams of this ITEC edition, I'm going to lose the second half of this amazing session. Before announcing the first team, I'm going to say the both ways to pose questions after each presentation. You can either use the Q&A button and write your question, or use the right and hand button to lively make your class. Let's now start immediately with the moon therapy, which are going to present a novel drug targeting an alternative pathway to renal cell carcinoma. The team members are coming from uh, Life and Health Sciences Research Institute from the School of Medicine of Universidade do Minho and are Fatima Baltazar, Fernanda Proença, Olivia Pontes, Patricia Maciel, and Marta Costa, which is going to pitch the project. So please come and break a leg. Thank you. Thank you, Christina. I think you're seeing my my uh, my presentation, right? Right. Okay, let's go. So, um, sorry. I am Marta from Moon Therapeutics, and our technology is about molecules for oncology. So we developed, sorry, we developed a new synthetic method 
that allowed us to obtain a library of new molecules. Given our focus on aggressive cancers, we tested uh, these molecules on a panel of cancer cells. And this confirmed that 20 of them had potent anti-cancer activity against renal cell carcinoma, triple negative breast cancer, acute myeloid leukemia, and glioblastoma. A structure activity analysis identified the most promising molecules from which we selected a lead MT1 that we took to in vivo studies. So in addition, um, our technology was submitted for IP protection. MT1 demonstrated activity against several hallmarks of cancer. For example, it reduces proliferation, decreases the formation of new blood vessels that feed the tumor and promote tumor uh, cancer cell death. So MT1 was able to do this at very low doses with high selectivity for cancer cells, sparing normal cells, was also active against cells resistance to current therapy and supporting other evidence that MT1 has a novel mechanism of action. Importantly, our experiments showed that MT1 has anti-cancer activity in in vivo models of human implanted cells. So on the left side, uh, you see uh, an untreated tumor that grows over time. And here on the right side, you see a treated one that decreases in size and also in the number of blood vessels. So these are our actual results for renal cell carcinoma. A dose response relationship was also seen in the mouse model with an effective inhibition of tumor growth after only seven days treatment. So here demonstrated for triple negative breast cancer. Importantly, for the highest dose, MT1 was able to inhibit tumor growth by 65%, as you can see here in these pictures of the excised tumors. So in addition, safety studies in two species, two species showed no toxicity for animals. Although we have excellent results for four cancer types, our strategy was to focus on renal cell carcinoma, taking into account uh, the need, the drug market size, and the potential for an orphan drug designation. So RCC is a very severe subtype of kidney cancer. Every year, about 400,000 new cases are diagnosed and 175,000 deaths attributed to this disease. Efficacy of the current treatment is low, and even the more recent modalities have low response and high relapse rate. So in addition, resistance to the treatment uh, usually develops within six to 10 months. So for that reason, mortality is particularly high for cases that are detected at an advanced stage. So there is really a strong need for more effective treatments tackling different targets. MT1 is a new drug for RCC. It has high potency and selectivity comparing with reference drugs, which reduces the potential for side effects. MT1 um, targets resistant cells to um, standard treatment. And in addition, we have evidence that MT1 has a novel mechanism of action. So the benefit of our technology will be really to uh, extend survival and improve quality of life of cancer patients, addressing a current unmet need. RCC drug market size is estimated at 3.5 billion and predicted to grow in the next years. So RCC is a rare disease allowing for an orphan drug uh, designation, which uh, will um, allow foster uh, regulatory approval, trial cost reduction, and a seven years market exclusivity. First line therapeutics include RTK inhibitors and immunotherapy. These ones are used in combination with the uh, RTK inhibitors because they act on complementary targets, but even then they only extend the progression-free survival by a few months. 
So our MT1 has the potential to add value to this therapeutic landscape because it targets a different pathway. In terms of our roadmap, we will continue R&D development to validate efficacy and safety of our molecules. Next, we will enter clinical trials and regulatory approval will be performed along the way. Considering the orphan drug designation, we estimate time to market of six to seven years. So these are our financial analysis for the full product development with market entry and following years. Drug pricing and the unit solds were inferred from the recent entries into the RCC market. Manufacture of MT1 is predicted to be uh, cost effective. So we foresee a high financial return based on the typical margins of pharma companies. Being a drug discovery company, our strategy will be to license at the end of clinical phase one, two to a big pharma that has the proper funding and market knowledge uh, to pursue clinical trials phase uh, three and market delivery. This is our team. We have a multidisciplinary expertise that goes from fundamental to uh, the applied science and includes active collaboration with industry. In summary, MT1 is a new solution for RCC patients that selectively targets cancer cells, is safe and effective against resistant cells. Furthermore, our preclinical data suggests that MT1 may be valuable for other cancer indications, which may be developed in the future. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Marta, for your great job. So now it's time for the Q&A. I kindly ask you all the team members to join um, the session. Uh, and we already have one question. So the question comes from Michael Thomas and uh, is wondering what kind of safety studies have you run in the mouse model? Okay, maybe I, uh, Patricia can, uh, can um, uh, answer to that. Yes. So what we did, so we, we actually have two pieces of evidence for safety. So we started by doing in the mouse, um, administering the drug for seven days and then assessing welfare just by a battery of tests that are established that you can see here actually in the left, the respiratory rate, uh, several, several physiological parameters, but also just observation of the state of the animals. And we did biochemical analysis of uh, liver toxicity, um, muscular lesion or heart lesion, and nothing was, so we had negative results for all those tests. And we also did organ pathology. Um, we extracted the organs after treatment and uh, everything had normal um, features. In addition, when we did the therapeutic trial, um, the first in, 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 in mouse, we saw that the animals were really doing well during the whole treatment. So at the effective dosages they had and no signs of, of toxicity. And again, we collected the organs and this was confirmed. So there's actually two different pieces of evidence to show this safety. Okay, thank you. Let's go to the following question. So it's coming from Diogo uh, and um, he asks, can you elaborate a little more on the collaborations with the industry? So refer in slide 16. And how does uh, that impact your uh, startup development? I think you, you can answer both questions together. Yeah, so maybe I, I can handle over uh, Patricia again and, and the other team members. Uh, so this, uh, the logos that we showed are from uh, actual and past um, and past collaborations. Yes. So, for instance, I have uh, experience in testing uh, drug efficacy uh, in mouse models of uh, neurodegenerative diseases, for instance, for several companies, uh, both in collab scientific collaborations, but also actually as provider, a service provider. So I have done this 
to obtain funding also to support my research. So this is something that I'm familiar with, with this um, process of testing drugs in vivo. And actually, that's why actually I joined this team initially. That was my contribution to this team. And uh, Professor Fernando Proenza, for instance, has other collaborations more in the chemical. Maybe you can comment that. Yes, as, as a chemist, uh, I, I tend to apply the knowledge I know on the synthesis of molecules uh, to problems of other uh, companies. So uh, I tend to have um, several uh, contacts with companies, not exactly in the pharmaceutical area, but in, in other areas where chemistry is also important. Okay, thank you very much. So we have another question, which is how important is the inhibition of the formation of blood vessels for cancer treatment? Yeah, very nice question. Patricia Rodrigues. Okay, so uh, actually the blood vessels are the main responsible for um, giving the nutrients and the oxygen uh, that the, the tumors need to grow uh, and to spread. So uh, if we uh, block that delivery, uh, we will lead uh, to starvation. So what will, what will happen is that the tumor uh, does not grow anymore. But even more important than that, we will stop the spreading of the malignant cells uh, to other parts of the body. And metastasis is, uh, as, we, uh, as we all know, uh, one of the, the leading causes of death, of, uh, death by, by uh, a tumor. Tumor, not really the primary tumor. So if we can um, affect this uh, this process, um, this this uh, it is is really a, a huge uh, advantage. We're not hearing you. Sorry, I'm sorry. So now we have uh, a question from Pedro Villarino. So you should be scary. No, I'm joking. So, uh, and this question is related to uh, the question related to the startup development. And Pedro is asking, what does it mean to target a new pathway? And why it is relevant from a business perspective? Is so, mean, uh, you know, already that, so. Yeah. So uh, having a different target uh, means just that our molecule acts in a different way than uh, the molecules that are used uh, nowadays in the clinic. And this is just a huge uh, advantage because uh, we are adding value to the market uh, and also to the patients. Um, we can be used, or the molecule can be used in the future uh, alone, or even in combination with the existing drug. Uh, um, and also, um, yeah, uh, that that's it. We are just adding value uh, to to the market. I don't know if Fatima will uh, comment on that. Okay, thank you. And a final question from uh, Ricardo Vieira Pich. What is the real perspective for combination with antibody therapy? Maybe I can answer that. Yeah. Yeah, hi. Uh, we actually haven't tried to, to do this kind of, uh, of combinations, but we have uh, evidence that, uh, that our compound targets some, some important pathways that are responsible for the lack of, um, of uh, response to immune therapies. For example, uh, we know that uh, our compound modifies the metabolism of the cells and actually the glycolytic metabolism, let's say the, the, the addiction that the cancer cells have to, uh, to glucose uh, is actually um, a mechanism that is related to resistance to immunotherapy. So we really have to do this, these studies, but we believe we, we uh, have some evidence that uh, supports that. Okay, Tim, thank you very much for your presentation and the level of confidence with your um, answers for the questions um, that the public posed. So now it's time for um, going to the next presentation, which is going to be NOV uh, team.
NOV uh, is coming from the NOV itself and Aveiro University. And the team members are Daniela Tavares, João Pinto, Marta Eduardo Pereira, and José Pinheiro Torres, who is going to present, uh, to pitch the presentation. And their presentation um, is recovering rare earth elements from e waste using marine algae. Thank you, Christina. I will, I'm now uh, sharing. Break a leg, Pedro. Uh, José. Sorry. <laughs> okay, but thank you so much. Um, good afternoon. We're presenting a project to recover rare earths. We are a for-profit company founded in develop green technologies to be applied in industries. The remarkable magnetic, electrical, catalytic, or luminescent properties of rare earths have long been involved in our daily activities. These elements are used in wind turbines, cell phones, electric cars, and are essential raw materials for the world's transition for a green energy. These elements are currently extracted through mining. They're not remarkably rare in nature, but rather are rarely concentrated into economically significant amounts for extracting and processing. It's very inefficient because extracting even a very small amount of rare earths requires large areas to be mined. On average, only seven kilograms can be extracted from one ton of ore. In waste, can have concentrations over 30% on rare earths, but only less than 1% is recycled. And why? Hydrometallurgical techniques and acid baths are used to concentrate rare earths, producing lots of toxic waste. The recovery rate can reach up to 60%. Also, chemical similarities of rare earths or lanthanides makes it extremely difficult to isolate them from one another. The current concentration and separation process is complex, costly, and toxic to the environment. We've developed a sustainable process to recover and separate rare earths using life saline microalgae. For sources containing rare earths, our technology will remove and separate these elements using a proprietary mixture of dilute mineral acids. After neutralizing pH, marine macroalgae are added to concentrate these metals in their tissues. The final step is the microalgae digestant to recover and purify each of the separated rare earth elements as oxides. An international patent application is now pending on this technology. And why is it sustainable and efficient? Algae grow and capture almost twice its weight in CO2. More than 90% of, of all regions are recovered and reused. No toxic effluents are produced and over 80% of concentration rate can be achieved compared to 60% on conventional mining. What you can see here is our first prototype. We are at a TRL5 referring to the absorption, four on extraction and selectivity and three on recovery. A TRL7 will be achieved in 12 months with a full-size pilot, followed by industrial-scale approach. Looking to rare earth market, Neodymium represents 91% by value of rare earths global consumption, meaning 2.45 billion euros. The market expects to grow more than 500% by 2030 to 13 billion euros. Supply can keep up with the rising demand, leading to depletion of historically accumulated stocks and ultimately scarcity of these critical magnetic materials if additional sources of supply are not developed. Our only immediate source to meet future demands will be through recycling. Currently, permanent magnets are the largest use of rare earths, accounting for 38% of the total market. These magnets convert electric energy into, into mechanical energy. They're used in electric cars, wind turbines, and computer hard drives. Their composition is mainly iron, 70%, and eudemium, 30%. For its high concentration and availability, 
this element will be our initial target. A wind turbine needs 200 kilograms of neodymium. A new generation will replace the old, the old ones, which means a large number of magnets will be available for recycling. Having as a source dismantled permanent magnets, we apply our technology to recover and purify neodymium as an oxide. Our suppliers will be recycling companies providing us with magnets. A neodymium oxide is sold through traders at the market price. Our potential competitors have not entered the market and are still at an early, early stage of development. And their main difficulties is the scale up, efficiency and pollutant methods. The project started in 2020 with technology, te technology development to identify sources of e-waste, optimize algae grow, and improve rare earths removal from e-waste. We are now in product development doing selectivity tests with our dilute mineral acid protocol, an IP strategy focusing on country selection for registration is also being planned and in early 2022 we will start scaling up and optimizing so we can enter the market in 2024. 2000 bioreactors are planned to be built between 2024 and 2026. In the first year, 500 bioreactors bio reactors will be operational, followed by 700, and the last 1800 in 2026. With 80 million in funds, we can start the first phase of bioreactors implementation together with the other necessary operations. At full capacity, more than 100,000 tons of algae can be produced, capable of recovering 5,000 tons of neodymium. Payback is expected at the end of 2024, one year after entering the market, and 2028 will estimate a total of 385 million in revenues. To achieve all these goals, a team of 30 motivated members is our engine. I represent NOV, and Eduardo, Daniela, and João de Averos University. NOV has a binding partnership with Averos University for the development of this technology. We've already published 15 papers, registered two patents, and a P2020 approval for 1.1 million. Our technology will respond to rare earths, global growing consumption, through circular use of resources, sustainable products, and innovation. Our initial market opportunity will be neodymium. After building a business, we will expand to other rare earths using the same technology. Thank you. Thank you, Pedro. Uh, sorry. <laughs> don't, don't worry. I think it's because of your name's boss. <laughs> yeah, maybe, maybe, maybe. Thank you for your kindness. Okay, so um, very interesting business opportunity. Um, Thank you. So now let's go to the um, Q&A session. Uh, all the team members are already present, so I'm going to I'm going to Jeff Anderson here, uh, and he says he's curious, uh, and he's curious because he wants you to explain better why. Um, your competitors have not yet achieved the rare earth market with the technology to recover it from electronic waste. Hmm. Uh, and why not? Yes. Yeah. Well, mainly, uh, as I told, uh, 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 it's not so easy. Uh, their ways uh, are still in the in a study phase and are pollutant. But uh, Daniela uh, can might answer a little bit of that. Daniela. I think that the, the main difficulty is the scale up, uh, the efficiency of the process and the, the pollutants uh, that use the, te the technologies. The, uh, I don't know, but there are, there are lots of projects going on, but still uh, none of them has reached the market yet uh, some of them are um, are have uh, good support financial support but it's not so easy uh, 
to reach the market uh, because technologically it's difficult to separate and concentrate. Okay, thank you very much. We have another question now from Paula Basch. And Paula is asking, are you thinking in presenting this to the European Commission? And then she comments, cooperation projects with the Global South are an enormous niche. Yes, uh, uh, we do think it's, it's quite important to, to, um, for the European Union in uh, uh, talking about markets because there is um, a, a commercial war between China and the rest of the world. China uh, controls it at all. And uh, the European Union is uh, supporting a lot of these projects. Um, it's not so easy to reach uh, the European Union, but we are trying to, yes, and trying to, to find uh, a pathway to, to, to reach the European Union. Yes, but thank you so much to think that this project can, can be important to the, to the EU. Okay, thank you. Let's turn to the financials now. Uh, Philip Postella from Corential Impact uh, asks you, so first of all, he thanks your presentation and then he asks you, how do you expect to reach the 18 million in funding? Private plus public? Yes, a private or public or, or maybe uh, getting the interest of the European Union because this is a... Um, um, a strategic uh, um, uh, matter for the European Union. But uh, yes, we, we, we have to look for funds. And by the time we are, we are with the patents and all, uh, we have to look for funds, yes. Okay, so we have another um, question from uh, Luis Pedro Cujaya. Let's come back for the core of your presentation. So he also thanks and congratulates you for the presentation. And Thank he you. asks, which are the sub-products, waste and inert, produced by your process, if any? Uh, and oops. the second part, do you foresee a use destination for these products? So, uh, um, as I understood, uh, the, the leftover pr products, yes? Um, yeah. Yeah. Oh, okay. Um, I will pass this question, but before, since we are uh, talking about magnets, magnets are mainly composed by iron and neodymium. So, uh, a second product will be iron, which, is, which also has value in the market. So, this can be a sub-product. About uh, the chemistry, uh, we are thinking on reuse it again, recycling it. But Eduarda uh, can can answer to you about that. Yes, uh, we are doing that at the moment using uh, very diluted uh, inorganic acids that uh, we uh, reuse several times before we need to get it out. And uh, even though when we put it out, it's just a uh, a small concentration of acid that uh, we can discharge with any problem. Uh, we start with the, the magnets exactly because they only have niobium and iron, and that way, at the end, we can recover almost everything. We are uh, aware that in the future, when we start to doing that with other e-wastes, we'll have maybe at the end some effluents that we must be care about. Okay, thank you very much. Let's go to the final question from Margaret Hoffman. Um, she comments, very interesting, and then she asks, if you have in a sample a mixture of RE, so rare, sorry, earth, elements. rare earth elements, could you separate the different elements? Eduardo, again? Yes, but uh, uh, just uh, uh, let, yes, with our first samples, we started with more complicated matrices and we can separate them. But uh, Eduarda, sorry. Yes, indeed, we didn't start our work, our research work with the, the magnets uh, because we didn't realize their importance in the real world and also in the market. Uh, so we started with other e-wastes and they have more than one element together. 
And what we realized from the literature, then we try, that's what we have a protocol, is that uh, using different concentrations of acids and different acids, we are able uh, to separate uh, most of the elements in an easy way from the, the waste. Uh, so at the end of the extraction, you will have the target uh, element in the, the solution you will uh, use to remove them from the U waste. That's what the big achievements uh, in the last month that we have. Okay, thank you very much for your well done work and for your presentation. Now it's time thank to go so to the following team to be on scale. Uh, there's still at least one question that we uh, are going to pass you by email and you will answer by email. Okay, thank you, bye bye. So now it's time for uh, Nevada team. Nevada uh, is coming from uh, Faculty of Engineering of Uni uh, Port University. Um, they are going to present a nano drug carrier device for Alzheimer's disease. And the team members are Deborah Nunes, Maria do Carmo Pereira, Maria João Ramalho, Magna Dabur, Stephanie Andras, and finally, um, Joana Loureiro, who is going to uh, make the pitch. So, girls, break a leg. Thank you, Christina. Good afternoon, all. I'm here on behalf of the Nevada team, and today I will present the Nevada device, which is a nano drug device for the Alzheimer's disease. As I'm sure that you know, dementia, it's all around the world. And the case of dementia, it's double every 20 years. 70% of dementia cases are related with Alzheimer's disease. And Alzheimer's disease, unfortunately, doesn't have a cure. But we have some drugs on the market to attenuate the symptoms. They are uh, presented as pills, as oral solutions, and also as a patch. But they have some lakes of efficacy mainly related with the way that they are administrated. CCD patients start to develop dysphagia and uh, don't allow to take the pills and even the, uh, the oral solutions and also develop erratic behavior. And most of the times they remove the patches. So based on the market needs and based in our knowledge, we develop a new product which is the Nevada device. Nevada is a biocompatible, biodegradable, and non-removable device, which will be implanted in the arm of the Alzheimer's patient. The device has a durability of six months and uh, will be implanted subcutaneously in the arm. The, nano, uh, the device is based on a nitrogel, which contains nanoparticles with the surface modified to uh, conduct the nanoparticles to the brain. In the brain, the nanoparticles will release the drug memantine. Memantine is the well-known drug mostly used for the severe stages of Alzheimer's disease. This process and this product is under patent process. We have been developed the nanoparticles that are part of our device, as you can see on the right image, that nanoparticles, which are the red dots, have the surface modified and have the ability to reach the brain area in a significant amount and then re uh, release the medicine in that site of action. That nanoparticles don't present toxicity over three months. So the patients that will take the uh, device, the Nevada device in their arm, will have a treatment with higher efficacy, with low side effects, and so with a high compliance. And the Nevada device could be implanted easily by a clinician during an existing routine. But Nevada is not just possible to use in the Alzheimer's disease patient. This could be a breakthrough in the way of drugs administration with patient, uh, for the patients with uh, brain disease such as schizophrenia, major depression, Parkinson's disease, 
and other disease. For that, we just need to switch the drug, switch the memantin to another drug. So we estimate our market size based on the amount of Alzheimer's disease in the moderate to severe stage over the Europe. And in the first year that we enter in the market, we expect to reach two countries, which are Germany and France. The two countries are the ones which has the higher amounts of AD patients, and also are countries with a high uh, financial capacity. The end users of the Nevada device will be the, the AD patients, but the caregivers will be the ones that will pay for the Nevada device. And we expect that the national healthcare systems will pay for it. But in, this, uh, in our market segment, we have a, a crucial actor, which are the clinicians that will uh, need to prescribe the device. It's important to mention that we have uh, two strong competitors in the market, which are the memantil and the uh, pills and oral solutions, and also the ribostigmine patch. Ribostigmine is another drug used in the Alzheimer's treatment, but with less expression than the memantin. However, that medicine needs to be administrated daily by a caregiver. But our device just needs to be administrated one time every six months. And so it will lead to a higher compliance and a low side effects. We cannot also forget the new approved drug, which are antibody based, that, are, that is FDA approved, but is still under efficacy surveillance. But it's also very expensive and could not be taken for all the AD patients. Nowadays, we are in the research and development of the VADA device, and we already start the proof of concept. We expect to reach the clinical trials in 2023 and finish in 2028. After that, we expect to enter on the market. It's important to mention that we have the opportunity to licensing our product during the clinical trials phase two. Regarding the financials, our product development is expensive. However, after to enter in the market, it's expected to be very profitable. As a business model, our product is an in-house development and then we will contract a manufacturing uh, organization that after the distribution, our product will reach the pharmacy. And finally, the AD patients, the Alzheimer's patients. The Nevada device was developed by a team composed by six women, which had different uh, know-hows. And they have a combined research experience of 45 years in development of drug delivery systems. So finally, as a wrap up, Nevada ensures a high efficacy treatment with lower dr drug doses, and it will be administrated subcutaneously and which leads a high compliance treatment. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Joana, very well done. Great job. Thank you, Christina. Okay, so now it's time for the um, uh, Q&A. You are all uh, there. So we have a question from Ronald Peterson. Do you know if doctors were open to this new form of, of administration of memantine? Yes, thank you for the question and it's very pertinent. Yes, uh, during uh, the product development, we were aware of a certain question and something very important is if the medical doctors will find this idea interesting or not. For that, we did uh, several interviews to neurologists and also uh, general clinicians. And yes, they find the idea very interesting and they answer us that they will prescribe. It is very important for them to be sure that the patient will have a constant levels of the drugs. And since the device will be administrated in the arm and could not be uh, removed by the patient, it will increase the compliance of this type of uh, medicines. Okay, thank you. 
Uh, let's go for, for the other question, which is coming from Patricia Rodriguez. Since you work in an academic environment, are you expecting to develop all the device under that environment? Well, this is a question that we have been talking about in the last uh, few months. We are uh, patenting our product uh, and um, this patent, of course, we develop the, uh, this part of device in the academia. The patent is part of our university, but we expect to create very soon. We are in processing, we are working on it to open our spin-off and then we will move to the, to the industry market. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, so another one from Luis Pedro Correa. And it begins by uh, congrats you for the presentation. So question, any reason for choosing the arm as target for the implant? Would it have the same efficiency if implanted in a different place, less accessible for the patient? And couldn't a patient suffering from brain disease such as schizophrenia eventually try to remove the implant? Thank you for this question. And the, the answer is uh, no, because it will be implanted in the arm, it's transdermal, and no one could remove. We have a chance to remove the device if you start to develop some uh, uh, adverse reaction, but it needs a medical doctor it, and it will be a small surgery. So uh, since it's intradermal, the patients could not remove the device. And uh, we choose the arm because it's the easy place to, to implant, but uh, we can choose uh, another, uh, another part of our body. Thank you very much. Now you have a question from Pedro Villarín. Uh -huh. You know how he is. So. Being a platform technology, how long it will take to adapt the device to another drug and what will be the biggest challenge? Yes, it could be adapted. Uh, one, uh, between one year to two years, it depends on the drug we can uh, change our nanoparticles and we can adapt our device. Uh, sorry, Christina, could you, ask, uh, could you let me know the second part of the question? Uh, uh, if, uh, what would, would be the uh, biggest challenge uh, okay. for, that, uh, for the change? During the, the device development, we use three different types of nanoparticles to being aware that for the moment, and in this case, the best one are the particle A. But maybe for the drug uh, B, uh, we will use another nanoparticles that we already test. This is why we call a platform because we have three different types of nanoparticles. And depending on the physical chemical properties of the new drug, we will choose one of that nanoparticle. So the time it's reduced because the device it's optimized and it's been, it's developed for three different types of nanoparticles. So it's quite easy. It will take a couple of time because we need to do more tests, but between one to two years. Well, I, I might guess as long as we are talking of already proved drug. Isn't it? Yes, yes, yes. No, it, okay. what I'm talking okay. is like memantine needs uh, an FDA approval. Of course, if it's a completely new drug, it's a completely different process because first we need to approve the drug and then to introduce in device. But if it's a drug that is already on the market, but it has also like memantine a lack of efficiency, uh, efficiency we could use it uh, in, a, uh, in a fast process. Okay. Thank you, Joanna. So a final question from Margaret Hoffman. Your customer must be the companies which produce the drugs. You know if they are interested? So have you already talked to? Not now, not at this point, because at this point it's not our aim to to sell the idea. 
we want to develop by ourselves the product we want to to get more financial support and also uh, investors we are uh, open to to a new investors and we want to develop the idea just in the clinical uh, trials phase two we could think and open an opportunity to licensing the product but it's not a problem that it's now on in the table okay Tim thank you very much for your presentation for the answers great job you did so you thank Congrats. you Tina, for all the help okay so let's go to the last but not least uh, presentation uh, which is going to be uh, from Purify. So Purify is presenting acne Y, a cosmetic face mask to prevent acne. So a great, a great, great, great project for us women at least. Okay, so uh, the team is coming from uh, CISECO, University of Aveiro. And is composed by Flavia Magalhães, João Nunes, uh, and Catarina Almeida, who is going to present the Purify. The stage is yours, Catarina, break a leg. Thank you. So, I will start. Can you see my uh, screen? Yes, we can. Yes, you can. Okay. So, uh, good afternoon. Uh, we are Purify, a new company specialized on materials functionalization. We are here uh, to introduce you to our approach against acne disease. I believe that everyone in this Zoom room are aware of what acne is, either because you had the experience or you saw someone close to you having it. All skin has a natural microbial ecosystem known as microbiome that keeps it healthy. When there is a disruption on that microbiome, a problem can occur. One such case is acne. Acne is an inflammatory skin disease caused by the hyperproliferation of the bacteria Cutibacterium acnes. In addition to physical consequences, acne has also a huge psychological impact since it can lead to low self-esteem, anxiety, emotional stress, and even depression. In fact, 30 to 50% of teenagers worldwide exhibit these psychological impacts as a consequence of acne. Just to reflect the problem into numbers, acne is the eighth most prevalent disease worldwide, affecting around 9.4% of the global population, including all ages and genders. The treatment applied to acne depends on the severity of the disease. Conventional acne treatments include for mild acne, benzoyl peroxide, an antimicrobial chemical that affects all the good and bad bacteria on our skin, leading to its redness, irritation, and retraction. In moderate to severe acne, only prescription treatments are available. It is usually administrated antibiotics, which can also affect all the bacteria, increasing skin sensitivity and leading to antibiotic resistance. As a last resource for severe acne, the patient needs to go to the doctor to have a prescription for isotretinoin, which can cause extreme skin dryness, scaling, and even photosensitivity. All of these affect negatively the normal skin microbiome that protects us every day. Therefore, there is a clear need for an efficient product which helps with acne while not negatively affecting our skin. After deliberation, our approach is to remove the excess of C. acne bacteria from the skin, restoring the balance of the natural microbiome. As such, our company will use EGY antibody, a biomolecule that will be specifically tailored to target and strongly bond to C. acne bacteria. Our technology involves using pure EGY antibodies to functionalize organic materials able to inactivate and remove the specific bacteria responsible for acne. Keeping this in mind, we present to you our product, Acne. Acne is an anti-acne cosmetic facial mask functionalized with specific EGY against the bacteria responsible for acne. 
the specific EGY antibodies will retain, inactivate, and remove the excess of C. acne bacteria from the skin, helping to prevent acne development. Acne involves a weekly use with the 10 minutes application. It will be presented as a pack of four facial masks format with a noble design. The goal is offer to our clients an effective solution for acne disease that is easy to use. Acne allows a 98% efficacy in the inactivation of C. acne bacteria. It helps to prevent the pimples and restores the balance of natural skin microbiome. Our customers will be people with a tendency for acne. Our product is inserted into the global anti-acne cosmetics market with a value of around 2.3 billion American dollars. It is important to highlight that this market is in constant growth with a CAGR of 9.1%. When we interview 133 potential customers, 77.2% we, we, uh, confirm that would be interested in acne. As we can see, our main competitors are other cosmetic brands that sell anti-acne creams and serum products that are based on chemical compounds that affect the natural skin microbiome of the users. Therefore, there is a potential space in this market for an anti-acne facial mask like Acne. Regarding our business model, we will outsource EGI antibodies and cellulose sheets for uncertified companies. The manufacturing and packaging of anti-acne facial masks will be appraised in-house. Concerning potential distributors, we select cosmetic specialized stores where acne will be sold to the end user in a pack of four masks for only 40 euros. We will develop our technology and product in the first two years before being launched to the market. During this journey, dermal safety studies and other regulatory requirements will be fulfilled. In 2023, we will launch Hackney in the market. To reach our customers, we will have a strong presence in social media using digital influencers. Due to the psychological effects of acne disease, we are going to start also self-esteem promotion programs and campaigns uh, in schools and other target spaces. Regarding acne sales, we will start in Portugal, and from 2024 to 2027, we will start the internationalization to other countries in Europe and finally in USA. As we can see, acne sales will start in 2023, and the break even point will be reached in 2024. That corresponds to our second year of sales, in which no more investment is needed. By 2027, we expect to expand to USA. Therefore, a funding of 2 million euros will be necessary to carry out the technology development, the product development and regulation, and to start the production and sales. Our team is composed by three PhD students from University of Aveiro, Mika Ternalmeida, Flavio Magalhães and João Nunes. We are compromised to offer you acne. Acne is a cosmetic facial mask with EGY that helps to prevent pimple formation and restores the balance of the natural skin microbiome. We purify your skin. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Katarina, for your very persuasive presentation. Good job. So uh, let's go to the Q&A. So we already have here one question from uh, Teresa Pinto Barbosa, who is asking, how do you control the quantity of C acnes removed? I can answer that. Yes. Okay, so since there are studies on the skin microbiome of people with and people without acne, uh, we are able to know which is the amount of bacteria that is needed for a healthy skin and uh, the excess of bacteria that exists on our skin. So when formulating the product, uh, the AGY we will use, we'll only take into account the excess of bacteria. That is only the amount of AGY needed to remove the excess C. acnes in this case. Okay, thank you very much. Let's go to the second one. So the second one is coming from 
Patricia Rodrigues, and she's asking, the anti-acne facial mask can be used in which type of acne? I don't understand the question. So the facial mask can be used in which type of acne? Okay, I can answer that question. So the mask prevents the formation of pimples in mild and moderate acne. Uh, and in the case of the severe acne, the mask can be used as a, an adjuvant to the treatment prescribed by the doctor. We expect that using the mask, we can reduce and or even stop the amount of drugs prescribed with serious side effects. Okay, thank you very much. So I have uh, further two questions. One coming from Ricardo Vieira Pitch, and he's asking, is the active principle proprietary? And you are going to outsource this development from scratch? I, I can answer that. Uh, so, as you know, the intellectual property protection is essential to ensure the success of Purify because it's a very competitive market, the cosmetics market. Uh, therefore, we think it's crucial to protect our main application of our technology. So, it's focused on the use of specific EGY antibodies against the bacteria responsible for acne, to functionalize cellulose materials, delivering the, the cosmetic anti-acne facial mask. So what we want to protect, it's the application. And um, also we want to um, try and um, develop um, a functionalization that it's uh, different. So we can uh, also protect uh, the, the method of functionalization since it's essential to our product. Okay, and the second part of the question. So uh, are you going to outsource this development from scratch? Uh, our idea, it was uh, to, to sell our product uh, initially and not uh, um, like, like to develop the idea and then sell it from scratch. So we are thinking, uh, at the moment we think that, but we can change our uh, perspective if uh, the, the time comes. Okay, thank you very much. So and I have here a question from Pedro Villarín. Um, so what makes you so certain that IGY does not affect the remaining microbiome? I can uh, talk about that. So um, IGY, um, I don't know if you know, but IGY is an antibody that is produced in chickens. So uh, when those chickens are immunized, it can deliver uh, EGY that is specific to the pathogen that we use uh, to do this immunization. So we will outsource the EGY that is specific to the bacteria responsible for acne. Uh, how can acne uh, be um, developed? Uh, because the bacteria uh, hyperproliferates. So uh, if we use this specific EGY, uh, it can, by, by being specific, I know, uh, you know, uh, it cannot um, tackle other microorganisms that are um, present or they are typically present in our skin. So we can preserve um, more or less, or we can restore the balance uh, of the natural skin microbiome by only tackle the excess uh, that we have from the acne bacteria. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you very much for your presentation. Again, great job. And thank you very much for your answers. And now it's time to close this amazing session. I'm very proud of all the teams and so the IC Tech team. So now I'm going to switch to Portuguese for the, for the closure. Um, e, portanto, tenho o prazer de chamar uh, o António Brandão Vasconcelos, que é o Presidente de Direção uh, da ICTEC, que vai fechar esta sessão. António, tenho, tenho que fazer a... isso. Pronto. Muito boa tarde a todos. As minhas palavras são naturalmente...
pessoas que participaram nesta sessão de encerramento do programa ITEC e, em particular, ao que neles estiver envolvido ao longo dos últimos três meses. Um agradecimento especial é devido a quem nos apoia nesta missão. Aos 34 investigadores que apresentaram hoje os seus projetos de negócio, aos 20 mentores que acreditam no programa e que de forma voluntária apoiaram as equipas e que desde já pedindo desculpa, mas merecem que os mencione cada um deles. Adriana Esteves, Ana Pereira, António Diniz, Cátia Magro, Cristina Gouveia, David Mago Bolé, Felipe Vicente, Federico Carpinteiro, Luís Gomes, Luísa Marques, Manuel Nina, Margarida Monsanto, Marisa Loureiro, Nuna Roteia, Paulo Amaral, Paulo Osvald, Richard Hampson, Rui Rosas, Ruth Souza e Tiago Brandão. A todos, o nosso obrigado. A special thanks agora em inglês to Roger Debo and, uh, from Hutchins University, uh, Stephen Markin from North Carolina State University, and Angus Kingham from Brown University, who, despite the current situation, made available their time to support the teams in this final stretch of the program. Gostava também de agradecer aos associados do ICD Tech que financiam o programa, à equipa do ICD Tech que torna a concretização deste programa possível, nomeadamente ao Pedro Vilarinho, à Cláudia Barbosa, à Cristina Simões e ao Olímpio Torres. E por fim, um especial agradecimento à Clark Modé por ter apoiado as equipas participantes do ITEC nas questões relacionadas com a propriedade intelectual. A CITEC é uma associação sem fins lucrativos que atualmente tem 24 associados cujo propósito é suprir uma falha de mercado resultante da inexistência de iniciativas com foco específico no apoio à translação de tecnologias desenvolvidas por investigadores para o mercado, seja através de criação de startups de base científica ou de inovação aberta. Através do programa ITEC, a ICTEC pretende não só motivar equipas de investigação a testar a viabilidade comercial dos seus projetos de investigação científica, como capacitar os investigadores que participam no programa na translação do conhecimento gerado através do investimento público em investigação e desenvolvimento. O ITEC é um programa totalmente gratuito para as equipas de investigação e é financiado pelos nossos 24 associados no âmbito da sua responsabilidade social cooperativa. Este gesto é de uma grande nobreza e demonstra a clara aposta da ICTEC em ajudar Portugal a transitar para uma economia com base no conhecimento. A atual conjuntura faz-nos perceber cada vez mais a pertinência em apostar na ciência e tecnologia produzida em território nacional e, sobretudo, em transpô-la para o mercado. Apesar de sermos orgulhosamente uma iniciativa privada, temos uma missão com impacto nacional e acreditamos que juntos vamos conseguir. No entanto, a nossa intervenção não acaba com o, o ITEC, mas sim começa. Os nossos associados são desafiados a apresentar problemas que necessitem de desenvolvimento tecnológico e a ICTEC, recorrendo à extensa rede de investigadores capacitados no programa ITEC, apoia a sua resolução. Termino, termino desejando boa sorte às oito equipas que apresentaram hoje os seus projetos, felicitando já pelo trabalho realizado e agradecendo a toda a vasta equipa que trabalhou com a ICTEC para levar a cabo esta edição do programa e esta sessão de encerramento. Não vos deixo, sem contudo, reforçar os três desafios. Aos que hoje terminam o ITEC, esperamos pela vossa participação na fase seguinte, o iEngine. Aos investigadores aqui presentes e que têm ideias com base em ciência ou tecnologia, esperamos pela vossa participação no iTech 2022, para o que já estão abertas as pré-inscrições. Às empresas presentes que ainda não são associados, que se juntem a nós nesta missão de aproximar 
a ciência e a tecnologia ao tecido empresarial. Muito obrigado a todos e boa tarde.